And May long weekend was the weekend, and they were right this year. May long weekend is a weekend where things are changing for us in the weather, and we're going to get out there soon and enjoy it. But I do believe the Lord has a word for us this morning, and the word for us this morning is play in the rain. <laughs> so it would be more appropriate if it were raining today. And when I wrote this sermon, it actually was raining. So, but. Uh, this is, a, this is a challenge. The Lord spoke to me. Uh, my, last, my last week of work, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, you need to begin to play in the rain. And I'll explain a little bit about what that means later on in the sermon. It's a challenge, and it's an encouragement at the same time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is powerful. We thank you that your word is sharp. We thank you that your word is active. And we just pray in this moment, God, that you would speak to our hearts and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I started ministry in the early 90s. And in the early 90s, there was a theme that was coming out in the church, and some of you may remember this. It was all about the river of God. Does anybody remember when they were always talking about the river of God? And we began to sing songs like, Jump, jump, jump in the river. Or uh, the river of God sets my feet a dancing. Pretty, pretty standard songs that we used to sing in the 90s. Brian, do you remember those songs? Do you sing those songs? Yeah. Uh, and, and so we had this idea. And, and, and then there was this uh, book that came out about the river of God. And it talked about the analogy of playing in the river with your father. That God was your father and he wanted to... He wanted you to jump into the river, and then you would play together, and he would throw you in the air, and he would catch you, and it was, it was just this whole idea of jumping in the river of God. And, and so we, 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 see, we saw the river of God in, in the 90s as this incredible move of the Spirit of God. And that was just, it was always just this happy place. It was this positive place. But I've learned that rivers aren't always easy. I mean, in Penticton, we, we think of rivers and we think of the channel. How many of you know that the channel really isn't a river? Like, you, you, we think of the channel and, and we see people and they have these incredible... We've seen some of the things they put together when they go in the channel, right? These big boats and then and, and you'll have like 30 or 40 people on this incredible boat they put together and they're drinking their beer and all their different beverages and they're laying back and they're, they're kind of just bathing in the sun and they think that that's a river. And I, and I think, and I say that because I believe that in the North American church culture, we've kind of began to believe that that's what the river of God is, that we just kind of sit back and we just enjoy the presence. I remember I shared this story before. Uh, I was in a river once in the Kootenays when I was a pastor in the Kootenays and one of my friends got married and we did a, our, his little bachelor party and they said, we're going to go tubing down the Goat River. The Goat River goes through Creston. And I'm like, well, is it safe? Oh, yeah, it's safe. It's safe. You know, he's grabbing an inner tube, and we're going to go down the rapids, and, and we're going to just have this great time in the river. And I had this little tube, and none of us were wearing life jackets or anything. But, you know, it was a river. It wasn't the channel. And I remember, here's the thing about the river. Like, we control the channel. You can't control a river. You don't control the river. The river controls you. And so I hop into this river, this, to the Goat River, and I got this little inner tube thing, and, and uh, there's like seven or eight, nine, ten guys, I can't remember how many it were, and we're having this great old time until the river took control, and we weren't prepared for where the river was leading us. The channel is a straight line. You go from A to B. You go from, from Okanagan Lake to Skaha Lake, but you know rivers aren't a straight line. 
The river takes you places. It takes you around bends and, and curves. And, and there's debris in the river. And there's actually danger in the river. There's unforeseen situations and circumstances that come up in the river. And I was on this tube. And all of a sudden, the current began to take me to this, this mount. It was a mountain. It was just a wall, a mountain, wall of rock. And the river, it, all of a sudden, I got into the current, and I was, I was speeding towards this wall. And I fell off my tube, and I, didn't, and I came up to the wall, and I was hoping to grab onto the rock, and then actually the river sucked me under. And I was out of control. And I was in a current, and it was just spinning me around like a, like a washer machine. I didn't know if I was up or down or where I was going, and... and uh, it seemed like in an eternity I was underwater, and I began to swim, and I was trying to, trying to push up towards, towards the, uh, the surface, and it, and it struck me. I didn't realize if I was swimming up or down. And so I had this thought that I need to stop fighting the river. I don't even know if this is scientific or if this is true or not, but in that moment I thought, if I just go with it, eventually it's going to let me go. And so I stopped swimming because I thought I might be swimming down towards the bottom. So I just stopped swimming and eventually the river spit me out. And I, was, I looked back and all my friends were way back there and they were calling my name. And the river. I, went into, I jumped into the river expecting one thing. But what I got was something completely different. The disciples jumped into the river. They jumped into the, nobody jumped into the river of God like the disciples jumped into the river of God. Jesus comes along one day and he says, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And what did they do? They jumped in. Why? Because they expected they saw what, what, he, what Jesus was doing. They saw his greatness. They saw the healings. They saw the miracles. When he spoke, the Bible said he spoke as one who had authority, not like the teachers of the law. And they said, hey, we should tie our wagons to this guy because where this guy is going, there's success. We know that from reading the Gospels that when they jumped into the river, they had a certain expectation of where this river was going to go. And the river was going to go to, Jesus was going to be this, this uh, uh, military leader who was going to overthrow the Romans. And they were going to be in key positions in his kingdom. They jumped into the river of God. Expecting one thing. But getting another. So in John chapter 16, if you want to open your Bibles and turn there, but it'll be on the screen, Jesus begins to uh, clue the disciples in about the river. He sits down and he has a serious talk with them. He begins, he begins to open their eyes to their situation. He says this. He says, I've told you these things so that you, so that you won't abandon your faith. That's not a good opening sentence. What he's saying to them is there's, there's things that are coming. You, you jumped in expecting the channel, and now you got some rapids. So he says, I'm going to prepare you. I'm telling these things to prepare you for what's coming. He says, for you will be expelled from the synagogues. And the time is coming when those who kill you will think they're doing a holy service for God. This is because they have not known the Father or me. Think about the Apostle Paul. Wasn't the Apostle, the Apostle Paul a fulfillment of that prophecy before he was a Christian? Wasn't he actually going about killing Christians, thinking that he was doing the work of God? And he's saying, and, and, and Jesus says, they're going to kick you out of the synagogues. What that means is, no, it's not, it's not that you can't just go to church on Sunday. It means you're going to lose your family. You're going to lose your friends. This river is taking you to a place. It's going to cost you something. You've jumped in expecting to be great, expecting a position of greatness. And he says, but actually, this is what's going to happen. You wanted to be my right, you wanted to be on my right and my left in this great kingdom. And now it's like he's letting the air out of the balloon. He's, 
They, 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 he's taking the wind out of their sails. Yes, I'm telling you these things now so that when they happen, you will remember my warning. I didn't tell you earlier because I was going to be with you for a while longer. Isn't this interesting? Have you ever watched new believers and the grace of God that's in their life? Isn't there always, doesn't there always seem to be the season where when somebody gets saved and, like, oh, and they experience God's grace and his mercy and his goodness for the first time, and they're, in every situation they face, they just are so excited, and, and God's, God's got their back, and, and everything's going to work out. Well, that's what it was like for the disciples. He's like, I let you believe that. I, let, I didn't tell you these things. You had a season of grace. You had an opportunity to get to know me. We spent all this time together, but now you're growing up, and I'm, I'm letting you know there's some things coming. Every person that jumps in the river has got to be prepared for things that are coming. And so he lets them know. And then he says this, he says, but now I'm going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking, where am I going? Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. They're so focused on their loss that they forget to engage God in prayer. He, he's told them he's leaving. And they're so grieved by that, they don't even engage him in conversation and say, well, where are you going? What's this all about? They're just so caught up in their grief. They're so caught up in their loss. They're so caught up in the situation that's around them that they forget that Jesus is still there and that they can engage Jesus in conversation. You can engage Jesus in conversation. But oftentimes we get so caught up in our situations and our circumstances that we shut them out. But he says to them, in fact, it's best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you and when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father. And you will see me no more. Judgment will come, be will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. Jesus says, it's actually a good thing that I go. You're in this river. It hurts. This situation is out of control. Everything that you've been hoping for and believed in, I'm it's like he's tearing the rug out from under them, but he says, this is good. You don't see it now. You don't understand it now, but this is good. Because if I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and righteousness is available. This is good because you were under the law and you could no, no one can be righteous under the law. But when I go, I'll send the Holy Spirit and you'll be under grace. And righteousness is available to all of those who believe. He's, he's saying, I'm making this available to you. He's saying this. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would ascend and descend. But he says, when I go, the Holy Spirit will come and live in you. So you'll be in the river, but I'll be in the river with you. I will be there always. He says, this is good because I'll always be there. The Holy Spirit will come. And then he says this in John 16, 33. I've told you all this so that you may know peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. It's good for you that I go. 
This river is going to be windy. This river is going to take you places that you didn't expect. You were expecting to be, you were expecting me to be this military leader, and you were expecting to be on my right and my left hand, and none of that's going to happen. In this heart world, you will have troubles, but take heart. I've overcome the world. It's good for you that I go. Because you can walk, if I go, you'll be able to walk into every situation that life throws at you, and peace is available. That's his promise. You may have peace. I started off talking about my sermon title, Play in the Rain. I'm in this whole new situation in life. I'm in a new job, a new, uh, new position. I used to work, uh, my whole working career, I was Monday to Friday, five on, two off. And now I'm in a situation where I work four on, four off. So I used to have a week that went Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I always knew the days of the week, but now I live in a situation where we don't have days of the week where I work. We have day one, day two, day three, day four. And so you walk up to somebody, another co-worker in the hallway, and the question we get is, what day are you? If you're day one, and the other guy's day four, you're jealous of the day four guy, and the day one guy is like, sucks to be you. And, and so you don't even, you, there's some days I go to work, and I, because I'm on day four, like day four feels like Friday. We love Friday, Right? But in, in reality, it could, be, it could actually be Monday, but it feels like Friday. And so I was in the gym. I, I went to work, and before I go to work, I go to the gym at the, at the jail, and it's day one. And I hate day ones. And I was, uh, and I, what I do in the gym is I, I have my phone, and I'll put a sermon on, and I'll work out, and and I'm just sitting there working out and going, oh, day one. I can't wait till day four. And the, the thought that popped into my head was, it was that phrase. It was like, you need to learn to play in the rain. I'm like, what, is, what does that mean, play in the rain? And what God was saying is, you need to rise above this. Because on day one, you're kind of like depressed. <laughs> you're trying to come to terms with the fact that you got your days off are all gone, and you got four long days ahead of you, and you're kind of depressed. Day two, you're kind of feeling a little better because your day one's behind you, but day three, it's like you hit a wall, and you're so tired, and you're just, walk, you're just dragging yourself around. Day four, you wake up, and you're giddy, and you're like, yes, it's Friday. And I realized that, I realized that my emotions were governed by my situation, and my circumstances. And I felt God say to me, you need to rise above that. You're bigger than this. And so, and, and, and that thought came to my, my mind, you need to play in the rain. And then I, and then I began to think about, at our, I live in a townhouse, I live in this complex, and in the complex we had this uh, drainage problem. Our dry wells were broken, and they hadn't been repaired in a long time. And so whenever we had a storm, we would, a big rainstorm in the complex, we'd have this huge puddle. And then we had some professionals come along and tell us that this is a problem. If you don't fix the drainage, you're going to have foundation issues in your complex, and, and you're, you have to get this fixed, and it was going to be thousands of dollars. And so we, all these owners, all the owners in the unit, we realized we have this huge problem And every time it rained, we were reminded of this incredible problem that we had. And if we didn't deal with it, we were going to have bigger problems. And so every time it rained, we saw a problem. But the kids saw play. Because when it was raining, and the bigger the puddle got, the more excited the kids got. And, and they, would, they would get, after the storm was over, they would get into their bikes, and they put their shorts on, and some of the kids actually put their bathing suits on, and they'd ride back and forth, and they'd have this big water. The kid, where we saw a problem, the kids saw play. 
And and then the Bible says we need to have faith like a child. And God said, God began to challenge me that in every situation, He's there. Day one, He's there. Day two, He's there. Day three, He's there. Day four, He's there. He says, You need to begin to learn to play in the rain. You need to begin to have control of your emotions. And, and it, what that is, is all about perspective. Where we saw a problem, the kids saw a play, and God said to me, you need to change your perspective because I'm still God on day one. I'm God on day one. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1 to 4. This is, this is it, hey, like the disciples... Like I said, they jumped into the river expecting one thing and getting another. And, and this is one of those moments where you see they were expecting something. It says, 18, verse 18, uh, chapter 18, verse 1, it says, About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him and put the, put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children... You will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Perspective. The kids weren't worried about the rain. Why, why weren't they worried? Because they didn't see a problem. They saw play. If this is a problem, that's okay because dad's going to take care of it. Mom's going to take care of it. The kids didn't have to worry about the bill. The kids didn't have to worry about the foundation. That's mom and dad's job. We're going to play. Mom and dad got it. The whole point is, in this world, Jesus says to his disciples, you're going to have trouble. So if you only ever focus on the trouble, you're never going to play. So Jesus says to them, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but don't worry, I've overcome the world. Don't worry. I'm greater than the trouble. Don't worry. Take your eyes off the trouble. Focus on the promise. And so then you can walk into a situation in the world where others have anxiety, where others are depressed on day one, you can have joy on day one. Where others are anxious on day, you can have, uh, day one, you can have peace on day one. And the difference is Christ is in you and you've, you've, you've grabbed hold of that promise, and you have childlike faith, and you say, God, even if I'm in a negative place, even if I'm in a prison, I can have presence. See, I jumped into a ministry. I jumped into ministry in the 90s. I jumped into the river. And when I jumped into the river, I was like the disciples. I expected the channel. I, I, I expected success in the Christian culture. Because that's what we're told to, that's what we're told it's all about. If, you're, if you jump into the river of God, you're going to have success, you're going to have opportunities, you're going to, have a, you're going to do well in the Christian culture. And so when I, when I jumped into the river as a young man, I, I looked ahead and I, like the disciples, I anticipated where this river was going to go. And I had many people talk to me about, you're going to speak to all these people and God's going to open all these doors. And so I assumed it was going to turn out a certain way. I certainly didn't expect or assume 
that at my age 42, I'd be working full time in a prison. You see, the river, the river of God is going to take us places. It goes over here. Sometimes it turns us around. And, and, and so then we want to fight it because we, our expectation was it was going to look a certain way. And then we're disappointed and we're discouraged. And we fight the river. But God's got a purpose for you in that river. And if the God takes you to a prison instead of a pulpit, and if you're not mature, or you don't trust God, if your identity's wrapped up into a position and not his presence, and you don't understand his presence is just as much of the prison as it is in the pulpit, you could, you could become discouraged. You could become overwhelmed. You could say, God has forsaken me. Or you could have faith like a child. And you could say, God's with me. Well, how do you know God's with me? Because he's promised me. God's got a purpose. Jesus had a purpose for the cross. The disciples didn't understand it. The disciples didn't realize it. But he said, if I lay my life down, if I, if I kill your expectations, even if your expectations die, even if I let you down, this is a good thing. Because I'm making my presence available to you. It's no longer going to be I come and I go. My presence, my presence comes and it leaves. It comes and it leaves. He says, no, now, when I lay this down, my presence is with you 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days a year, no matter where you are, I am. All right, faith like a child. Like, I think this is a really... This is a real important concept for the church to get because if we want to be great, Jesus said that's the only way. I remember when we took uh, Wyatt, he was probably about three years old, we took him for a, a shot, a needle. And there's nothing worse than taking to a kid to get a needle. It's, it's terrible. They yell and they scream and they kick and they complain and they, it's, like, it's like you're taking them to be shot like with a gun. And a firing squad. Like, they just think it's the worst thing in the world. And so, and this is why it's first needle. And I'm trying to think, like, how can, I, how can we get this done without, like, this big, big ordeal? And we're waiting in line. And we've kind of taken the kids there. And we haven't really told them why we're there. Because if we told them, it was just going to be this really long morning. And so, we get there. And they're like, okay, guys, you're going to get, get, get a needle. But afterwards, we're going to take you for ice cream. That was kind of our big plan. So, faith... She, she's the older one, so we let her go first, and she just freaks out. That's just like, she, it's just like the worst news in the world, and like we're, it's, kind of, it's actually super over the top, and we're super embarrassed because she's just like, we're the worst parents in the world, and she's just terrified. And then it's Wyatt's turn. He's like three or four years old, and he sits in the chair, and I, I'm like, I got to distract him. What am I? And I, 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 I kneel down beside him, and I'm like, look at me, Wyatt. And the nurse has his arm over here, and I'm like, look at me, Wyatt. And for some reason, this question just popped in my head, and it was just a question to distract him. I said, Wyatt, who's your favorite superhero? And he looks at me without hesitation. He says, you are, Dad. And the nurse was just like, what? And I was like, yeah. And then uh, who's your favorite superhero? You are Jesus. That's faith like a child. Where we just believe what he says. Jesus looks at us and he says, who's your favorite superhero? We, and, and, but then we grow up and you see, faith... She's older, and she's come to terms with the fact that I'm not a superhero. She's kind of caught on that dad isn't a superhero. And why it's kind of, there's going to be a day when they realize, where he realizes, yeah, dad, you're pretty average. Um, that day hasn't come yet. I'm still, pretty, I'm still pretty awesome in his eyes. And that's in the natural, see, that changes. But Jesus is always... The same yesterday, today, and forever. 
Dad, you got it. Dad, I'm okay with this needle. You got it. Father, it's day one, but I'm okay because you got it. It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that the trials go away. It doesn't mean that the river isn't going to take us to difficult places. But faith, like a child, is the, is actually simply the revelation that He is with you in it. It's like the disciples when and when Jesus said, "Let's go to the other side," and then the storm comes. And they're, they're, they're crying, whining and complaining. We're going to die. We're going to drown. We're going to drown. And they're, and they're looking at the storm. They're looking at the storm. And the, the waves are getting bigger. And, and the winds are getting stronger. And they're so caught up in the storm, they forget that Jesus is in the boat. They don't engage Jesus. And if they would simply engage Jesus in the storm, all things are possible. Faith like a child is simply the ability not to deny you're in a storm, but to recognize that he's in the storm with you and he's greater than the storm. Faith like a child simply means that the presence of God is as real in a prison as it is in a pulpit. Colossians says this. I'm going to finish real quick. Colossians says this. The mystery has been kept in the dark for a long time, but now it's out in the open. God wanted everyone, not just Jews, to know his rich and glorious secret inside and out, regardless of their background, regardless of their religious standing. The mystery in a nutshell is this. Christ is in you. So therefore, you can look forward to sharing in his glory. Paul says, here's the key. Christ is in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not a big church. Not success in a Christian culture. But when I walk into my workplace, or I walk into school, or or I walk into wherever it is God has placed me, Christ in me. And so even if I work in a really negative place, even if I work in a place where where it could, should in the natural cause all sorts of anxiety and fear and all these different emotions to rise up in me, I, I step in and I have peace. Where others are anxious, I have peace. Where others are are full of fear, I have faith. It's not about me handing out Christian tracts. It's not about me, like every time, oh, I got to tell people about Jesus. I got to tell people about Jesus. I got to shove Jesus down people's throats. It's like, it's like, no. There's something different about him. There's something different about her. Everybody else in this place is negative, but they're positive. How is that possible? Oh, that's Christ in me. It's not about even, it's not about being fake. It's not about being like the power of positive thinking. It's about simply realizing, yeah, I'm in a storm, but Jesus is there with me. Christ in you is the key. And the fruit of Christ in you, we already talked about it. He said, you're going to have peace. The fruit of Christ in you, you're going to have hope. The fruit of Christ in you, you're going to have faith. You're going to have courage. Wherever God places you, he's prepared you for this. Jesus, That's what Jesus was telling them. I've been with you for three years. I didn't tell you this, but but in these three years, I've prepared you for this. You're prepared for where you are because I am with you. So you can rise above day one, day two, day three, day four, because Christ is in you every day is Sunday. Every day is Sunday. We come, see, if we get faith like a child, then it's not, it goes from, we, oh, I gotta get to church because I need the presence of God so bad. Christ, no, no, no. When, when we get faith like a child, it's like, no, Christ is in me. Wherever, every day is Sunday. 
Christ is in me. Like in the Old Testament, Moses is wandering in the wilderness and he steps out and, and God says, take off your sandals so the place where you're standing is holy ground. Why was it holy? Because God was there. And then it's in the Old Testament, it was because God was there. In the New Testament, it's because you're there. Christ in you. Wherever you step is holy because Christ is there. So you can be in church. You can say, oh, well, I need to be in church because I need God's presence. Or you can say, no, everywhere I am is church. Everywhere I am, Christ is there. And that, the fruit of that provokes people to jealousy. I need what you have. It's not fake. It's not conjured up. Before the cross, Jesus spoke to storms. After the cross, you speak to storms. Christ in you. Psalm 1611 says, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with the eternal pleasures at your right hand. You can be a person of joy in a negative place because his presence is in you and in it, where his presence is, there's fullness of joy. Everything we need, we already have. The peace, the, 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 what the disciples needed to get through that storm was already in the boat. The key to, to the kingdom of God The key to the kingdom of God. You don't need a position. You need a revelation. You need a revelation of childlike faith. Because God has you where you are. So that Christ in you can change where you are. Every day Sunday for us. Every place is holy for us. Every storm, every storm is just an opportunity to play. Jesus used to play all the time in the storms. Some of the greatest things he ever did were in storms. And he walked on water in a storm. He was just playing. He, he, what, he, what was he doing? He was just demonstrating to, to the disciples, I'm greater than this storm. Wait, wait. Lazarus, he was playing. You guys, he, he looks at the disciples, he looks at everybody around, and he says, you don't get it, I'm here. I'm greater than this situation. Day one, day two, day three, day four, it doesn't matter. God has you where you are so that the presence of God can flow out of you, provoke, provoking others to jealousy. And then those opportunities to tell people will organically come from that. But if you're miserable in a miserable place, you don't have childlike faith. If you're negative in a negative place, you need a revelation. If you're hopeless in a hopeless place, What's the point? You can come to church all you want. The real test is, what are you going to do out there? And the only way to rise above that is to understand that he is there with you in the midst of it all. And the fruit of his presence is peace, joy, hope, and love. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand? Father, Help us to just accept childlike faith. Lord, we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to conjure it up. We don't have to fast and pray for 40 days and 40 nights. We simply have to receive the revelation that you are with us. 
Lord, help us to see, receive the revelation that where we are is holy ground because you are in us. Help us to receive the revelation that every day is Sunday and every, we can worship in every place because you are in us. Lord, help us to just walk in that revelation today. Receive that revelation today. It's grace, it's mercy, it's your love that gives us that ability. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Be blessed as you go. Have a great long weekend. Amen.